All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining us for the Division of Archaeology's virtual lecture series. My name is Megan Falk, and I'm with the Department's Office of External Affairs. This is our fourth installment research series webinar hosted by the division. Each third Thursday from tonight through October, you can join us at 6 p.m. Central Time for a new lecture. We're excited to share the series with you as an opportunity to learn about new research happening here in Tennessee. Excuse me while I get to the next slide here. There we go. Before we get started, just some minor housekeeping. We're using the platform WebEx to conduct this evening's presentation. The image on the slide depicts some of the options available on WebEx. This should be um, displayed on the lower center part of your screen where all these icons are showing. You've been muted upon joining this meeting, but please make sure that your microphone is on mute throughout the presentation. Additionally, please keep your videos off to help prevent any bandwidth issues. Your microphone and your videos off when there is a slash mark through both of those icons. Another icon I'd like to note is the chat icon. Um, it looks like a call out bubble. We'll be using this when we come to the Q&A portion of our session. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have the opportunity for questions. And while you may ask a question during the presentation in the chat box, we'll wait to answer those questions until the conclusion of the presentation. The only time we'll be calling on individuals to speak is to provide an opportunity for our call-in users to ask questions. So if you've called into the meeting, we will allow you to unmute during the question, question session. Um, otherwise, if you did not call in, we ask that you please use the chat box to ask questions. Right with that, I'm going to pass things over to our state archaeologist, Phil Hodge. Phil? Okay. Um, well, thanks, Megan, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm coming to you tonight from the Division of Archaeology's office in Nashville. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth installment in our third Thursday virtual lecture series. We established this series to provide a forum for archaeologists to share their current research after having to cancel two years of our traditional in person conference. Uh, we also hope this series serves to build some momentum toward resuming our regular conference in January of 2023. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to thank Megan Plock for helping plan and organize tonight's lecture uh, and the entire series and for moderating tonight. Megan is TDEC's Director of External Affairs for, um, uh, for TDEC. Appreciation is also extended to Mike Morrow with TDEC's Office of Communications. Uh, he assisted with publicizing the series and getting press releases out to the various newspapers across the state. Within the Division of Archaeology, staff archaeologists Macy Orand and Aaron Dieterwolf have helped to organize the series and have done a lot of the heavy lifting for our office. Without further ado, um, let me introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Morgan Smith. Dr. Smith is currently an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. He earned his PhD in anthropology from Texas A&M, where he studied at the prestigious Center for the Study of the First Americans. Prior to this, he worked for the National Park Service's Southeastern Archaeological Center in their Compliance Division. He has over a decade of experience in underwater and terrestrial archaeology, having directed multiple excavations at underwater pre-contact sites, as well as surveys and excavations of terrestrial and submerged landscapes throughout other locations in North America. His contributions to underwater archaeology include efforts to develop methods and models that accurately and reliably, reliably locate underwater pre-contact sites. Dr. Smith, thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your research with us. Um, with that, I will mute myself and turn the virtual floor over to you. And I believe that Megan is going to advance your slides. So whenever you're ready, just give her the, the call. Sounds great. All right, can everybody hear me all right? I'll have to share. Yep. Can you just find? All right, can you see it? 
So, all right. Okay, excellent. Okay, great. Um, well, yeah, thanks so much for everybody. Um, Phil and Megan, you guys did a great job introducing everybody. So I think everybody's been thanked. I think I can just kind of skip past that. But uh, yes, my name is Morgan Smith, um, assistant professor at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and really excited to be here today to talk about um, a unique resource in underwater um, cultural heritage in the Tennessee River. Uh, go to the next slide now, Megan. Okay, so what is underwater archaeology exactly? Um, this is broadly the study of submerged cultural heritage, and um, this includes a lot more sites than just shipwrecks, which jump out a lot when um, people think about, you know, underwater archaeology, they think of a shipwreck. But the reality is that um, there's quite a bit more out there, including inundated, entire inundated landscapes that indigenous peoples once occupied, um, sunken harbors, sunken cities, etc. So if you look at the left side of um, this slide here, what you're seeing is a map of shipwrecks um, from the last hundred years. So there's the concentration of shipwrecks. And if you look at the right hand side, all of those red areas are actually submerged lands um, that were inundated at the height of the last glacial episode. So around 24,000 years ago when glaciers were huge and um, sea levels were commensurately low, all of that red land was inhabitable by peoples, and we know that there are sites out there. It's just a matter of finding them. Next slide, please. So why teach students underwater archaeology? This is a good question. Um, honestly, I think it's one of the more um, exciting fields in terms of um, job growth over the next couple uh, decades. So if you look at the uh, projected employment overall for anthropologists and archaeologists, this is um, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics here on the left. Um, over the next decade, anthropology and archaeology is expected to actually grow quite a bit, 7%, almost on, on par with all other occupations. Um, and this is because typically, um, you know, as we're seeing um, agencies focus more efforts on infrastructure, we always typically see a commensurate employment bump. Um, with anthropology and archaeology. But one of the really exciting things that's pushing underwater archaeology and is going to create um, a huge need for underwater archaeology practitioners is actually the proliferation of offshore wind farms. So just recently, um, the Biden administration wants to power over 10 million homes with um, offshore wind energy. And this is a this is kind of like the frontier of cultural resource management, where we're talking about installing these wind turbines on the continental shelf, which requires ground disturbing activities typically to anchor them, and then running transmission lines over vast areas of the seafloor, which likewise um, requires uh, cultural resource management to ensure that um, archaeological sites on the continental shelf aren't adversely impacted. Next slide, please. So with archaeological industry hiring quite a bit of archaeologists, um, something that's been overlooked, I think, for the last couple of years is what's called the blue economy. So um, the United Nations just recently declared this is the decade of ocean science. Um, and there's all kinds of initiatives out there right now that um, a lot of archaeologists don't know about, but that are employing people pretty rapidly in um, offshore industry and in the ocean and Great Lakes economies. There's an effort right now called Seabed 2030. Um, the goal of which is to map the entire um, world seabed by 2030. To do this, we're going to need lots and lots of people who are proficient in hydrographic survey. And we have a lot of potential here for employing archaeologists. And, and this is going to be done whether or not archaeologists are involved or not. So we might as well. Um, you know, try to get archaeologists in the world while seabed is happening, we can identify as much as, as possible. Next slide. This is more data to demonstrate that um, the times are going to change it. Offshore will be tremendously, whereas offshore oil and gas will more or less keep its same um, growth rate. But offshore renewables is really what's driving um, a lot of development on the continental shelf. Next slide. So this image is um, a, basically an overview of lease areas that have been either proposed or are under development on the United States continental shelf. And as you can see here, there are dozens of lease areas 
um, covering tremendous amounts of land on the East Coast. And these are in areas like um, the Coastal Bight of South Carolina and areas of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, and Maryland, where recently underwater archaeological excavations have started to find um, preserved paleosols and in some cases preserved early archaeological sites. And then there's a couple images here, Megan, so I'll just tell you to, to do one click here and that should bring up the next image. Um, this is as of two months ago, the Biden-Harris administration recently expanded wind lease areas to the coast of California, which is an incredibly rich area, um, both archaeologically and for um, possibly more offshore wind farm leases. One more click. Um, these lease areas are just really hot commodities right now for um, offshore renewable energy companies. Um, you know, there was a record breaking 4.37 billion dollar lease sale um, regarding that early California wind farm. And a lot of that money is dedicated to, to, you know, compliance, which involves cultural resources. So, like I said, archaeologists really need to be in the room um, with these conversations, because if we're not, the cultural resources are going to get overlooked. One more um, quick through here gives an estimate, um, conservative estimates and, um, you know, optimistic estimates of how many jobs and um, how many millions of dollars in wages and output and GDP is going to be produced um, by offshore wind leasing. Um, so you can see in here in construction operations and in total employment, we're looking at over 100,000 new jobs, which um, submerged cultural resources um, can certainly be a part of. And then two more clicks, I think, will bring you to um, basically all of the offshore lease areas currently, which, you know, the, the more conservative case is about 1.6 million acres, um, and the high case is almost 3 million acres. So these lease areas are roughly the size of, you know, either if you take a small end, Delaware, or the state of Connecticut on the high end. So these, these are, are areas that are totally unexplored archaeologically, where we know archaeological sites are going to be found. Um, like I said, it's just kind of a matter of training the next generation um, to how to find them and, and preserve them. So we'll move to the next slide here. Um, anybody who is kind of somewhat aware of archaeology, I'll just kind of basically go through cultural resource management anytime, um, you know, there's ground disturbing activities in, in federal lands or on federal projects or cultural resource management gets involved. And these are the kinds of structures that are being put in on the continental shelf. And just um, to clarify these, some of these leases are going active, like, very soon. So this kind of ground disturbing activity is happening in shallow water or transitional water, which shallow water for um, oil and gas and renewables is still several hundred feet um, beyond what divers can do. Those are being anchored into solid bedrock foundation all the way through undisturbed marine sediments. And even in deeper offshore wind farms, um, such as off the coast of California, where the continental shelf is very deep, um, there are these new floating wind farms that are being put in. And these are being anchored with incredibly large weights in the bedrock and connected to cables. But as you can see, in either case here, really, um, there is major ground disturbing activity happening. Uh, these wind farms also go to um, a, a floating power unit, which is also anchored into the continental shelf. And then there's transmission lines running all over the place. So lots of um, ground disturbing activities, lots of potential for archaeology. Next slide, please. So how can we train students to meet this demand? Um, I'd say one of the key um, parts of the current job market is having diverse skill sets and being able to uh, ensure students can land that first job um, out of undergrad and get their foot in the door. And oftentimes that involves being able to wear whatever hat they're asked. Um, and I think that something that really helps with that is being able to be proficient in the use of, of kind of the latest, uh, most cutting edge technologies. And in addition to things like um, GIS and um, and geographics, remote sensing and geophysics is is one of those extremely employable skill sets. And just um, to put it out there, in case um, nobody's aware, remote sensing or geophysics this is using instruments that exploit some kind of um, geophysical property of the Earth to non-invasively image what's um, what's in the ground or on the ground. And um, this is, I think, an 
area of expertise that's ripe for undergraduate involvement. Um, for example, uh, um, go ahead and, and click here, Megan. This is me um, surveying out in Walker Lake in Nevada, um, steering with my foot. That's not something that you need a PhD to do. So that would definitely be something we can put undergrads to work on. And honestly, running these instruments is really um, kind of a, a labor intensive effort to start them. And then you're kind of driving a boat back and forth for a long time. So a lot of industry companies are looking for undergrads who are capable of doing this kind of work. Um, because it's a lot less expensive to pay an undergraduate to to drive a boat than it is to pay somebody with a PhD to drive a boat. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about these remote sensing methods in underwater archaeology, there are really a, a few that I'm going to harp on today. Um, so the number one that we are the most often that you see when you talk about underwater archaeology is what's referred to as side scan sonar, and I'll show you some imagery from that here in a second. Um, essentially, side scan sonar is kind of, you can see it on the left side of this image. There is a small yellow vehicle being towed by this schematic boat. And side scan sonar emits a high frequency sound that um, we can't hear out either side of the instrument. And based on the time and intensity with which that sound returns to the instrument, it creates a two dimensional image of the seafloor. Um, the, the upside to side scan sonar is it's super quick and it gives you really nice imagery. The downside is that it's only going to show what's on the surface, so you're not going to see anything buried with it, which includes most um, submerged indigenous sites. So it's really good for finding shipwrecks and structures, not so good for finding the other 14,000 years of human history that we have in North America. Um, the other really nice one is uh, seismics and sub-bottom profilers. So these are low-frequency acoustics. So, for example, side scan sonar um, operates typically in the range of 500 to 600 kilohertz or higher. Um, most sub bottom profilers operate in the range of 4 to 24 kilohertz or lower. So, much lower sound. These are actually, this is um, a sound that's actually emitted in the um, human auditory range. So, you can hear these, these chirp um, instruments for the most part. And what they do is they work basically how ground penetrating radar works terrestrially. Um, so it sends a low frequency sound wave into the subsurface and reflections are made based on different densities and intensities of, um, of what's buried beneath the surface. And you can image stratigraphy that way. The last one is, is multi-beam or swath bathymetry. And this is more of a, uh, a technology that's been taking off more, more and more frequently. And this is a way of emitting many, many, many different um, lasers or light sources and um, basically mapping bathymetry or topography underneath the sea surface very quickly. So those are mostly the instruments that we're talking about here. I'll go to the next slide here. And one of the things that I immediately noticed um, on coming to Tennessee, uh, so I grew up in Florida and I grew up doing a lot of underwater archeology span there. And um, as was said, I, I did my PhD in Texas where we also worked on a series of sites. And the moment I got to the Tennessee River, I, I thought that I immediately thought this was one of the best training grounds um, I could imagine for furthering underwater archaeology. First of all, there's an extremely dense concentration of sites from all eras submerged beneath the surface. Many of these sites um, were surveyed before inundation. Some were excavated and tested. Uh, so we have stratigraphic data. We know what archaeological components are present, and we know where the sites are because um, we can georectify these pre-GPS locations onto modern uh, images of the river. Um, perhaps the biggest thing is that it's a logistically simple, controlled environment. Um, it's amazing how quickly bad weather can tank an entire offshore operation. Um, so being able to be on kind of a placid river um, where you're not really worrying about um, anything aside from an occasional thunderstorm and you can get into the river really quickly and get out really quickly is, is, is a lot. Um, it's a shallow water river for the most part, largely free of obstructions and hazards. Um, so that makes towing remote sensing instruments um, pretty simple. And there's a lot of anthropological significance in imaging these areas of the river that are now submerged. Um, if we're thinking about kind of the earliest peoples to come into Tennessee, they probably moved along these river valleys that are now inundated. So we don't really have a clear picture, a complete picture. Um, of the full use of the Tennessee River Valley without seeing what is now beneath its surface. 
And I think it's uh, kind of a fun thing to point out that um, a very large study called the National Reservoir Inundation Study, which was conducted by the National Park Service in the 1970s ahead of the damming of um, eight or 10, maybe more reservoirs in the American West, um, pointed out that you know for, for areas that are impounded, um, the use of underwater archaeological techniques to retrieve new classes of data to speak to new research problems should be con seriously considered. Um, basically, what Dan Linehan, the author of the study, is saying is that this is a really unique laboratory setting almost, um, where variables are, for the most part, uh, controlled for. We can understand a lot about submerged resources and the Tennessee River Valley by looking at what's beneath the, the surface. Next slide. So I have two case studies for you here today that we've been working on at, at UTC. The first is the um, shipwreck of the Chattanooga. So actually the first time I taught underwater archaeology at, uh, at UTC, I decided that this was going to be kind of our class project, was that we were going to um, track down as much archival data as we could about this shipwreck um, that I heard about through a couple locals who said that there was a shipwreck um, on North Shore of the Chattanooga, or not North Shore of the Tennessee River that had to do with the Civil War. And I thought that'd be really cool if we, um, you know, get, get some students together, kind of take this as a, a experiential learning class where we find the information, we find the archival data, we project where the shipwreck's going to be, um, and then we get the instruments and the resources and, and we go out there and, and we look for it and we map it. Um, so this was a really useful thing for students. We're teaching them how to find primary records and connect them to the archaeological process. And we kind of work through it all together all semester. Um, next slide. I'll just give a little bit of background on um, this plucky little steamship. So following the Battle of Chickamauga, um, the Union Army was, was holed up in Chattanooga by the Confederacy, so that was a victory for the Confederacy. And the Union generals basically begged for reinforcements to come in through Nashville, and several columns were sent. Um, but a supply chain bottleneck happened in far northeastern Alabama, where the, the current rail line ended. Um, and materials could not be brought further into, into Chattanooga at that time. Next slide, please. So we're talking about um, tens of thousands of soldiers, thousands of draft animals needing rations, and basically the option uh, was, just, was made to outfit several local um, kind of Frankenstein steamships to resupply Chattanooga. Um, and it was going to be a pretty daring mission because they were going to have to sneak through Confederate outposts on Raccoon and Lookout Mountains, as well as above um, Williams Island right before they would get there. Not to mention this is pre-damming of the river, so there's lots of shoals and navigational hazards. So this night raid was planned um, to resupply the, the, the starving city. Next slide. So here's a, an image, one of the few images that exist of the, of the Chattanooga shortly after its supply run there on the left. It was built out of a flat bottom riverboat called a scow. And there's an image from Harper's Ferry on the right of, of what a scow typically looks like. And it was basically just this Frankenstein ship where they took one of these scows, they slapped an engine and a boiler and some superstructure on it, threw on a stern wheel and a flywheel, and loaded it down with as much, uh, as much material as they could, um, as they could muster. And what's really neat is there's diary entries from Generals Grant, Hooker, and Rosecrans, um, all about personally reviewing the ship and all about talking about how significant this operation was to resupply Chattanooga. Um, so on the night of October 29th, 1863, it headed upriver. Um, next slide, please. And um, there were strong headwinds. It was kind of like a, a cool classic story where one of the hogging chains, which, which basically keeps the, um, the, the whole structure of the ship together from flexing apart broke en route. Um, so it's, it was entirely possible the vessel could have exploded and this could have been a, a folly and the Union Army would have had to pull out of Chattanooga. But they made it there and this opened the famous cracker line, um, as it's called, and a, a few other steamships would make this trip, um, but the Chattanooga was the first one to actually make it and, and resupply the city. Next slide. So the main question was what happened to it from what we gathered in, in this class. Um, it basically made its runs and, and served um, purposes as a, as a river runner in, um, in the Civil War for a couple years and then basically kind of sat and slowly sank in place. 
um, in the Tennessee River. And I've heard rumors that it was eventually burned um, to the waterline, the superstructure, um, but we haven't been able to confirm that with anything. That's just some kind of local lore. And one of the cool tips that we got for where to look for it um, was people told us it was it was adjacent to Market Street Bridge, um, but a local actually turned us on to this photo. So this is a 1917 era photo of the Market Street Bridge shortly after its construction. And right here in the, if you um, click once, Megan, that should bring up this red box, highlighting this little um, ship tucked away under the bridge there. And if you click one more time, Megan, just kind of zoomed in image um, where this is an image of the, the Chattanooga on the upper left-hand corner. And a ship that looks really similar um, to it is, is kind of hiding out there in the exact location that we actually ended up um, identifying a shipwreck on the, the scan that seems to fit the, the bill of the Chattanooga. So let's go one more quick. Um, so this was a, a really fun exercise. We got permits from TDOA to, to work in the river. It actually was kind of an interesting um, legal question of who actually owned the shipwreck um, because I first contacted the TVA and under the Abandoned Shipwreck Act, actually, um, this was um, under the purview of the state. So. Um, we got the equipment donated for the underwater archaeology class by a, a remote sensing company out of Georgia. Um, and we got a bunch of people to kind of cover the boat rental and give us a discount on the boat. And um, we got some insight from a, a colleague of mine at the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command that were interested in, in, in what we we're going to find. So we'll do one more click here. And what we ended up using was that side scan sonar method that I talked about earlier. So the question was, can the shipwreck... Or, Two questions of the research design. Can we identify the shipwreck um, through side scan center as the Chattanooga? Um, there were a couple, there was there's a couple YouTube videos out there of people diving what looks to be a shipwreck on um, close to the area. And a couple locals, um, there's an old uh, newspaper article about people who had been looking for it and thought they had found it, but none of the artifacts mentioned in the newspaper article were period. Um, um, or anything that was totally diagnostic to it being the, the Chattanooga. And the other question was, what can geophysical mapping tell us about the current preservation status of the shipwreck? Is the resource in danger? So here's the schematic of what um, side scan sonar is, is, is basically doing. So you have this tow vehicle and it's emitting sound from either side. And again, based on kind of the the density and, and the reflectivity of some of the things on the surface, whether it's a rock or sand or mud, you get a different image of what's on the bottom. So here we go, um, one more click here. Two more clicks maybe to the side scan, first side scan image. So what we ended up seeing, and um, what you'll see here is basically a couple of things. First of all, we have a, a scale in meters up at the top um, beneath, there's a, a waveform up top and then a, a yellow bar with the scale in meters. So the instrument is looking about 25 meters out to either side. And this is kind of what typical side scan imagery looks like. The middle is what's called a nadir. Um, that's an acoustic shadow beneath the instrument because it's a side scan sonar. It doesn't scan down. So you'd have to do another pass to the right or left to image what, what we missed there. But one of the things that uh, popped out was when we first did the survey around the area, we saw this structure here, um, which is a modern barge that, um, you know, doesn't really have anything to do with the, um, the archaeological site we were looking for, but was nonetheless interesting in, in a site in and of itself. And we'll click one more time here. And there's actually, in this image, um, there's actually three shipwrecks on top of each other. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side here, kind of on the, the seven meter mark at the top, you can just barely see some kind of cross hatching. Um, those are our ship timbers or, or ship construction parts. And then on the right hand side, you actually see um, one barge lying on, on top of another barge along with trees and all kinds of stuff strewn around down there. And one more click will take us to the image of the, the what we think is the Chattanooga. So this um, image here on the right so I'll draw your attention to the wheel-shaped thing underneath um, 11 meters out on the right channel here. So this circular bit is part of the flywheel. There's two stacks, one about 
um, a quarter way down the image on the five meter mark. And more importantly, this doesn't look like the previous two images, which were kind of more modern turn of the century barges. This ship construction fits what a, a flat bottom riverboat scow would look like. So these cross timbers braced here, um, kind of a more tapering bow and a little bit wider. Um, so we're pretty um, reasonably confident that, you know, this, this is in fact the, the Chattanooga and the local lore was right that it was, it was just kind of hiding in plain sight there on, on Market Street Bridge um, the whole time. So I'll move to the next slide here. I'll bring to the second case study here. This is another site that um, I've taken students out to. So this is the LaCroix site. Um, it was originally recorded by uh, Lewis and Nieberg in 1956, and only one citation exists in the Tennessee Anthropology um, Journal about it. It's about six pages long, and there's really not a whole lot said about it, except for the fact um, that there's an extensive Paleo-Indian complex there, and there are numerous um, fluted points. So we'll click through here once, and we have some images of, of blades, and utilized blades and then um, click through again and we're looking at some in scrapers and gravers and clicking through again more more kind of unifacial tools and last, looking through um, a series of, of fluted points um, and unfluted lancelet projectile points so basically um, the article stated that you know there were about 4,000 specimens uh, examined and there were additional more that, that hadn't been examined yet and the site was located on the bank of the Tennessee River not far from a very large permanent spring and there were um, there were proposals to, to test the site but um, I don't think it ever nothing ever really came of it and uh, before it was inundated and it's now permanently in, inundated but at um, kind of the time of discovery was heavily collected um, and the fact that it experienced numerous wet and dry cycles as the uh, lake level kind of came up and down is, is not really a good thing for organic preservation but nonetheless it was, it was a kind of interesting site and, and right in our backyard in Chattanooga so I thought we'd round up some students to take a look at it so we'll go to the next slide here and the research questions for this was is the now inundated spring still present or is it buried can we see it on the on the bottom and the answer to this question uh, will let us know the relative burial depth of the other archaeological components of this site. So if the spring is still there and, and still flowing, um, we'd expect a lot of stuff to still be on the surface. But if it's buried by a, kind of a thin layer of, of sediment, um, it might be in better preservation um, capacity than we thought. And the other question, so as opposed to side scan sonar, we use sub bottom sonar on this site. Can subsurface geophysics indicate the presence or absence of any stratigraphy or organic preservation at the site? Um, or, or can we find the site itself? And this is going to kind of key us into whether or not there might be a bit more potential um, at the LaCroix site to look into. Next slide, please. So here's a couple images of where we were working. We're working in a slough off the Tennessee River um, near Sequoia Nuclear Power Plant. Um, next slide, please. These are geo-rectified images of, of where the site is from old maps. It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, first for me. I've never worked adjacent to, to cooling towers. So it's kind of uh, inspiring to see that level of science and a little bit a little bit scary at the same time. They're definitely very ominous in the background. Um, but there we are with a couple of faculty from um, the, the geology department and uh, students, Hannah Bowman and Maddie Shaw assisted in this operation. So next slide, please. So here's the first transect that I'm gonna show you of the sub bottom profiler data. So that green dot is the approximate area of where um, the, the site is recorded and that red line is basically where the instrument is oriented. So if you click here, this will take you to a full image of what the sub bottom profiler data look like. And we are looking downriver here um, with the west side of the bank on the left side of the screen. So I know that's a little flipped. Um, but what you're seeing here is essentially, um, this is kind of the, the left hand side of the screen you're looking at this kind of little swale here where you can actually see what look like two distinct sediment layers and our scale over there on the right is in meters 
Um, so that's probably a meter of sediment thickness. And then there's other returns coming from much deeper um, at about the six or eight meter mark. It looks like that may be um, kind of another levy feature. And then this very pronounced dip is the modern channel of the Tennessee River. So, and you're actually kind of seeing what are more likely than not um, about a meter thick layer of perhaps modern sand sediments um, kind of blanketing the top of that uh, channel. And that dark return is probably um, incised bedrock from the, from the river channel. But what's really interesting is that left-hand side of the screen is about where the site is. And click once, Megan, it'll bring up a little red box around that kind of wavy feature in the water column. This is a bit more of an aside, but one of the neat things, and we'll click one more time. Um, this is an article that um, I recently published with, with a team um, where we think it might be possible to non-invasively detect um, sites with stone tools. It essentially works um, kind of how a tuning fork works for a guitar, where a certain type of acoustic um, sound wave can be emitted that makes some lithic artifacts vibrate, and then that vibration can be seen in the water column. And it's kind of interesting that the um, that that feature appears right next to where the um, the site is. It, it could be a number of other things. Fish um, also produce resonance features. There's one in the right hand side of the screen here in the middle of the channel. Um, but that's just kind of a, a neat aside and um, interesting. Quick one more time here, and we'll look at another um, cross section here. So we went across the channel on the first one, and then this is going kind of perpendicular to the channel across that slough. We'll click another time to get that uh, navigation image out of the way. And this is kind of what that area looks like. So very flat, but these two um, black lines in here, um, the distinct ones that go down um, quite a, quite a ways. Those are probably old um, spring channels or river channels. What typically happens is um, sound really doesn't like air because it doesn't can it, it's not as um, conducive to the propagation of the the pressure waves. So when it sees air um, or when it sees gas pockets, it tends to um, blow out and not give you much data, which is kind of a bad thing, but is also kind of a good thing because typically what that means is that there's some kind of organic material present there. Um, because as you can see, there's a thin layer of sediment on top of that, so that's buried. And the reason we think, or we are pretty certain that's organic material is because as organic material breaks down, it produces um, gases. So that's probably what we're looking at is a series of small tributaries and streams that are now inundated that are hanging out there. One more click. So here we are going further out. This is another um, kind of parallel transect. Click one more time to get it away. And here's kind of um, those two channels again, but a little offset. And as they're making their way towards the, the deep Tennessee River Channel, the modern channel, they're dropping off or they're incising downward quite a bit more. One more slide here. And here's another um, kind of view going perpendicular to the channel. We'll click to get that navigational picture off there. And Here's a much more zoomed out view of what some of those channels look like. So on the left there, you have the modern Tennessee River channel dropping down to about 45, 50 feet. And then these series of other adjacent channels. So these are probably sloughs or, or small streams, and those are typically very productive. Um, and they're especially places where you'd expect people to live adjacent to a large permanent water body in these kinds of areas where you have multiple ecotones coming together. So click one more time. And I have one more. This is an in-between image um, running parallel to the channel here. Uh, and this is just kind of another view of this kind of significant swale-like backwater feature uh, where there's quite a bit of organic preservation and, and about a meter of perhaps of sediment on top of it. Um, so anytime we have buried sediment layers that are showing up like this in, in the sub-bottom, it's usually a good sign for, for preservation. Click one more time. Um, so kind of what are we doing next? Um, there's now a formal course in underwater archaeology that I teach at UTC. So it's taught every spring. Um, and the focus of it is going to try to always be to map kind of a different section of the river. Um, we're also going to be doing a little bit more work around the LaCroix um, and Chattanooga sites this fall during the archaeological field school at UTC. 
Um, so a little bit more mosaic mapping um, and kind of a little bit more high resolution studies to see exactly what we can we can determine about that shipwreck and a little bit more side scan data around LaCroix to see if we can find that that submerged spring. And then um, something I'd really love to do long term is begin a, a much more systematic kind of whole river survey where we we survey the entire Tennessee River, or at least close to Chattanooga. Uh, the entire thing would be a big bite, but the, the thing close to Chattanooga with all those instruments that I mentioned, so bathymetric instruments, side scan instruments, um, and sub bottom instruments, because there's quite a few inundated sites, um, some really well known ones like Dallas Island, where, um, you know, these sites have never really been. Um, there's no baseline surveys done of them since they've been inundated. We don't really know what condition they're in or, or the state that erosion or, or possible looting is taking place on them. So it'd just be a, a kind of an interesting study that would combine a lot of research questions with a lot of great student involvement to prepare the next generation of, of these underwater archaeologists. Um, and we've started a new geoarchaeology concentration at UTC um, with the geology department where we're emphasizing remote sensing and submerged resources also. Um, and we've also started working with the geology and hydrology um, and environmental science programs, as well as fisheries and, and visualization programs um, and environmental studies, too, because one thing that we can also see in side scan sonar data of the Tennessee River is, is quite a bit of trash. So um, kind of interesting survey done of, of point pollution sources and, and non-point pollution sources to get an idea of the, the health of the river also. I'll click one more time, and I think that'll take us to the end. All right, and that's all I have. Really appreciate um, all the uh, agencies up here involved, um, helping with permits, helping with logistics, helping with equipment, and helping with funding. Um, and thanks to you all here today for coming out to hear me talk. Well, thanks, Morgan. Great presentation. Um, was glad to see your uh, acknowledgement slides there. Of course, we're happy to support this research uh, and your work at UTC, but. Glad to see tribal support on there as well. Um, you know, modern archaeology is beginning to incorporate tribal perspectives into the research designs and interpretations of the past more and more. So it's great to see that you're doing doing the same thing with this research. Um, yeah. One thing I, I wonder I, if, if you could talk a little more about is um, specifically how you know archaeology is a, a puzzle without all the pieces. Um, and we focus so much on terrestrial sites because they're easier to access and they don't have the same logistical challenges that working on submerged sites have. And I wonder if you could speak to what a better understanding of the submerged archaeological record, how that might help us understand the bigger picture, um, because since it's so biased toward terrestrial sites. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think when you look at some of the biggest questions in in you know the history of humanity like when did people leave africa first when did people colonize australia and north and the americas first all the answers to those huge timing questions and population movement questions are all on submerged lands um we're also talking about uh things that outside of you know your um your amazing rock shelters in Tennessee and, and Georgia and Alabama that contain some of the best preservation of organic materials. So one of the big data gaps in southeastern archaeology is the radiocarbon record, particularly from the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. It's also the paleo environmental record. There's not a, a lot of great paleo environmental localities in eastern Tennessee. There's a couple in north Georgia, um, but they don't have great radiocarbon control. So in addition to filling kind of methodological gaps like that, you're also just looking one of the neat the neat thing to me about being on the Tennessee River with students is when I get out there, I get really excited because I think, wow, this is how the first Tennesseans saw Tennessee, right? Like they probably most of them probably didn't come over land or over mountains. They probably moved up the drainage. So it's just like a really interesting switch of perspective for me to instead of looking at the river all the time and seeing it this, as this obstacle that I have to drive across on my way to work. Um, seeing it as the super highway of activity um, that's encasing a lot of the earliest sites, probably the the paleo, there's five or six inundated Paleo Indian localities in, in the Tennessee just within um, 20 miles up and downstream of Chattanooga. So we're missing things on time period, we're missing things on data gaps, and I think we're missing things on perspective. 
um, by, by not paying more attention to these sites. Great, thank you for that uh, elaboration. Uh, Megan has been checking the chat box here to see if we have any questions from our audience. So Megan, I'll pass it over to you to moderate the Q&A. Great, thank you. Yes, again, everyone, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box here. And I will pause briefly to see if we have any questions from our call in users here in a couple minutes. But we do have a couple questions in the chat. First question sure. is, are you planning on any underwater field schools, including diving and excavation underwater? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, currently, no, <laughs> um, for a couple reasons. Um, one, I think if you if if students are do desire that, and they definitely do desire that, there are a couple great schools out there that do that already, um, and that have the logistics in place, and that have the the people in place to do that. It's a it's a big effort um, to do that kind of work, and. Honestly, my personal opinion is that that's really not where the jobs are um, for students. I think, um, you know, one of the, on, on one of the slides I had, what did I say? It's a good quote. How can we train students to meet this demand? Uh, we have to be more realistic about them regarding job opportunities. And I love diving and I love excavating underwater. It's super fun. Don't get me wrong. But nine, if you talk to any um, industry underwater archaeologist and you ask them the last time they put dive gear on. It was probably to just go recreational diving and, you know, the keys somewhere. They don't dive for work. All of this work is being done on remote sensing and non-invasive studies. So there's actually not a whole lot of, I mean, excavation is the last, always the last resort, right? It's only if the site's in danger or it can tell us something we can't about, um, about the past that we can't get any other way. And I think there maybe eventually might be some potential in the in the Tennessee River, but I think there's a lot more to be done, um, particularly on the cutting edge of geophysics. I mean, I think it's it's pretty amazing to think that we might be able to remotely detect um, prehistoric sites using acoustics. I mean, that that's just like a um, next generation kind of technology. And I think that's far more exciting than um, going under the Tennessee River and not being able to see your hand in front of your face and try to grope around and, and find something. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more to be done on the geophysics side, and I, I don't have any plans at the moment to to get a field school going for underwater. But for underwater geophysics, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Another question it pertains to um, some of the courses that might be offered. Are there any plans to offer graduate level courses or programs in underwater archaeology? We have a, a working group with geology and environmental studies currently um, to put together a couple courses and, and perhaps eventually a, a resource management concentration um, that's kind of like uh, teaches students to both look after cultural and ecological or, or biological or, or geological resources. There is a plan in place for that, um, but it won't be this year, you know, so it, it's a couple years out probably, but we do have an eye on on growth. And I think um, the Tennessee River archaeological resources is super amenable to that and the student population is really excited about it. So it's definitely something that could be seen in the future. Great. That's so exciting. <laughs> oh, I hear about that All right. So I see that we do have a couple call in users. Um, so I'm going to sure. give folks who have called in a moment to speak up if they do have a question to um, ask your question and to unmute yourself, just press star six. And when you're done with your question, please remute yourself by pressing star six again. So do we have any questions from our call in users? Everyone all at once now. We have any more questions from our other participants this evening? I have one more, maybe just to close us out here. Um, and it's you were speaking a few minutes ago about where the the work is in underwater archaeology that it's more on the the you know uh, uh, geophysical side and not excavating underwater archaeological sites. Um, so in a, in a cultural resources management context and a compliance context, 
um, you know, on a terrestrial site um, that's identified and is determined to be of, you know, meet certain significance thresholds, um, the project will be redesigned to avoid it. And sometimes there are design limitations that make avoidance impossible. Um, and therefore, site, those sites are mitigated or excavated. Does that same process happen for underwater archaeological sites as well? And do you have more room to, to negotiate avoidance plans um, in compliance settings? Yes and no. Um, I'll, I'll say it, it happens really uh, readily for shipwrecks, although there still have been some mishaps. Somewhere out there on Google, there's an image of a shipwreck cut in half by, a, by an oil pipeline that was missed by a, um, by a survey. So that does still happen. Um, and the name of the game is definitely still avoidance. Um, there have been some some studies like um, test cases like the Mardi Gras shipwreck that were um, that have been undergone a little bit more investigation in deep water. But I think one of the biggest oversights is the submerged prehistoric um, or pre-contact record because since there's no way to determine where those sites are, you can't avoid them. You know, there's there's no way to find. There's only really two ways to identify submerged prehistoric sites at the at the moment. That's to hope that there's a surface expression of them and that they can be seen inside scan sonar, um, which that's been done um, in the Great Lakes by um, Ashley Lemke and, and John O'Shea, two submerged prehistorians with the University of Michigan. They've actually found inundated caribou hunting blinds and, and drive lanes in Lake Huron. Um, and that's also been done in Haida Gwaii in the, the northwest coast where they've seen some structures on really old shorelines. Um, but that's a pretty like hopeful thing that they're going to be exposed after 13,000 years. That's really um, a geological issue. If you're in an area with sedimentation like Tennessee Valley or the coast of Florida, you're not going to have any um, exposed sites. And the other way that most people use is through modeling, where they go out and they take the sub bottom profiler, for example, and they see a feature that looks promising, um, whatever the definition of promising is to, to whoever's looking. That could be a sinkhole or the margin of a river channel or a place where you'd expect people might aggregate. And then you take a core from that area and you see whether or not there's, um, you know, a soil there, or a stable landform that somebody could have lived on. Um, but that's it. That's as far as it goes. It's it's pr it's pretty much just guesswork. You know, it's it's basically saying this could there could be a site here. You know, so you should avoid that. So I think that's one of the biggest gaps right now in underwater CRM is it's very historic resources biased. Um, be, but that that's mostly because there's really just no way of identifying these sites remotely with any accuracy or, or efficiency. Which is why I'm really excited about the future of, of remote sensing and, and geophysics, because I think that's where the breakthroughs will happen. And that's where we'll start to, uh, you know, we're destroying the offshore prehistoric record at a totally unknown rate. You know, it could be completely fine or we could be plowing through um, remarkable sites out there and not knowing is is pretty scary. So I think that's that's the, the real way forward. And I think that's where a lot of the jobs and, and funding and, um, and opportunities are going to be over the next 10 or 10 or 20 years. It's really interesting, Morgan. I think that uh, acoustic uh, technology sounds really promising and look to, to learn more about it at some point in the future. So um, yeah, Megan, if there's if there's no more questions in our chat box or from our, our uh, participants tonight, I will toss it back to you to close us out. Um, tonight and talk about our next lecture. But for now, let me give a uh, big thanks to Morgan for presenting tonight. We really appreciated the presentation and enjoyed learning about your research and uh, hope to learn more about it in the future. So, absolutely. Can't wait till Pride is back. And thanks yeah. again, everybody. January. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Knocking on wood. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Morgan. That was extremely interesting. I'd love to learn more. Um, really appreciate your energy and your passion on this subject. And if for folks, if if you think of some questions um, over the next couple of days, feel free to send those to me or Phil. I paste our contact information in the chat. We'll make sure those get to Morgan and we'll get you an answer. Um, outside of that, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please continue to join our monthly virtual webinar series. The Division of Archaeology is hosting this once a month on the third Thursday of the month through October, and more information can be found on the Division's current research in Tennessee archaeology website. You can find this online with a quick uh, Google search or whatever search engine you use. 
If you search TDEC Division of Archaeology Research Series, it should be the first item listed. And there's also a link in the chat box. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Phil using the contact email provided. Um, and I'm about to post a link here in the chat box to a survey. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, there's not too many questions. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes. We'll just appreciate any feedback or insights to continue um, for us to continue to improve our virtual event as we continue the series. And again, thank you all for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you on August 18th. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.